أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أم حسبت أن أصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من آياتنا عجبا إذ أوى الفتية إلى الكهف فقالوا فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا فضربنا على آذانهم في الكهف سنين عددا ثم بعثناهم لنعلم أي الحزبين أحصى لما لبثوا أمدا نحن نقص عليك نبأهم بالحق إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم وزدناهم هدى Assalamu alaikum This is Akib Welcome you back to another episode of Boys in the Cave I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts Tanzim and Josh Alhamdulillah I'm joined by my special guest Our guest is Dr. Muhammad Gilan who is a writer, podcaster, student of Islamic jurisprudence Quranic science, theology and philosophy he holds a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Victoria and is currently pursuing a medicine degree at the University of Queensland, so which is a master's graduate component of the medical program, am I correct? Yeah. And he used to be a personal trainer. Any other group that's interviewed him has that level of detail about Dr. Gillan and sort of his <laughs> past life as a power like, trainer. We're not just trainer. podcasts, we're journalists. You yeah. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tell me how you grew up. <laughs> So I'm not like, you know, we all know like you're from Canada and you did your work there for most of the time and you're new to Australia and you're living in Queensland at the moment, came down to Sydney, but how are you enjoying Australia overall? <clears throat> I like Australia. Australia's fun. Australia's really good. What would you say are the main differences you've sort of observed between Canadian society? Because it's Western society, right? But there yeah. are sort of differences you pick up on. What would you say you've noticed? Um, uh, maybe a bit more laid back on the end of just personal interactions. They're a lot more laid back, I think, Australians are than Canadians. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other one that I heard explained really well that sums it up is, some may disagree with this, but Australians are nice, Canadians are polite. Okay. So for, ca- for Canadians, it's like, yeah, we'll be polite to your face. Because, and I think that has to do with just being bordering with America, which is America is going to be rude to your face. Um, oh, okay. And Canadians, so okay, Canadians Canada, are like, yeah. we're going to be rude behind your back. Wow. Um, and Australians, for whatever reason, it just feels, I don't know, my, my personal interactions have been quite positive. And it, yeah. every time I've had that interaction, it's always felt, to me, oddly, just more genuine. It just felt there was just more care or something. I don't know. It was, it's really nice. Some may disagree with that. You might have a bad experience or something, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I like to look at it. For us, it's just the default, so we can't really tell until we get to America and yeah. those other countries. See what the differences are. Yeah. But yeah, just to delve into things, Dr. Gillian, I, I wanted to wait until the podcast to sort of comment on your work and the stuff you've been doing. So just a personal background, I finished high school in 2012, and I sort of had no idea of what to do in university. I was sort of flipping up between the regular sort of STEM degrees that people do and my sort of more interests in the humanities, that sort of thing. And it was around that time I discovered your work. It was pretty much when you were coming out with your blog. And oh, wow. Well, <laughs> since day one, it's been like almost five years, and... Just alhamdulillah, just the sort of beacon wow. of light you've been in the, in that initial guiding Inshallah. stage. When wow. when you finish high school, that's when you become interested in yeah. these topics, right? Like evolution, does God exist, that sort of thing. And that's where it sort of began for me. And you were a big part in my decision to just quit STEM and just commit to the humanities. Oh, so I'm doing, I'm a philosophy and history major currently. Good for you. Yeah, inshallah, wow. I'll be doing honors. Yeah. Yeah. This is interesting. <laughs> wow. That's all right. Lot, cool, yeah. inshallah. In terms of just, you've been doing all this stuff online, you know, with the blogs and then, you know, with your book club. And, you know, you did your PhD in neuroscience. What made you suddenly, you know, want to pursue like a med in general? Um, it's an interest in wanting to see things for myself as opposed to be told about them. So anytime you read, and I mentioned this in several podcasts and every time I talk about this, every time you read anybody's work, what you're reading is not just objective facts about whatever field that they're talking about. You're also reading their interpretation, their take on things. 
um, how they perceived it and they're presenting it to you. So you're reading somewhat of a perception of it. So it's a combination of the two. I, I don't want this to come across like we're completely uh, negating the idea of objective reporting. That does exist, but uh, you, you're not going to know for sure if what you're getting is always going to be just the objective facts or if is, or am I just getting a perception. So when it comes to science, for example, you know, now that having, having gone through a PhD program and, and having the background in neuroscience, when I read neuroscientist work, I'm better equipped to tease out from it where are they philosophizing and where are they just talking about the science itself and, you know, accept and reject accordingly. The same thing goes with medicine. And my specific interests are more, again, aligned with an extension of the field of neuroscience, which have to do with neurology, neuro, uh, neuropsychiatry, psychiatry in general. Um, and so when you read the works by popular works by psychiatrists and, and things that they have to say about them, and psychiatry especially, which is now just a material science you know, branch of medicine, yeah. we have problems from an Islamic perspective with that. You know, the human being is not just a physical brain. There is more to you than just your body. Yeah. And so to get access to that, if you want to have you know, interaction with patients, you have to have, be in medicine. And for you to be able to treat and, and follow treatments and to see what's going on and to see cases and conditions and how they develop, and you have to be in the field. So, yeah. so you wanted to encompass all of that from a medical sp- perspective as well. Yes. So yes. Not just your PhD in neuroscience, but the, sort of the clinical sort yeah. of experience you have yeah. through medicine. It's, a, it's the practice of things. You know, we give so much weight to intellectual knowledge of things yeah, yeah. and reading Did about you? them. And we, don't, we hardly ever give enough weight to the practice of it. You know, you can have, and that's why, like, it's a really interesting point that uh, was observed with moral philosophers. It turns out that they're the least moral people, um, no, ethically horrible. speaking. Yeah, because it's it's one thing yeah. to know about something, but it's another thing to practice, practice it. it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's uh, that's why when it comes to this religion, for example, it's there is so much emphasis on practice. Yeah, you know, you could be the greatest scholar in the world. I mean, even in the hadith, you know, you have the first people to go into hell are going to be a reciter of the Qur'an, uh, it's going to be a scholar of the religion, yeah. which is quite scary to think about. But if you look at the, like what was going on with these people, it was the intention that they sought the knowledge for and they did the practice for, and it didn't impact them in any way. So that's why it's uh, I, I give a lot of weight to something that is largely ignored by a lot of people, which is knowledge gained through practice. If you try to go and ask a surgeon, for example, one of the top surgeons, like, why did you make this decision over the other one? You know, and it could be a totally counterintuitive or a decision that goes against guidelines yeah. sometimes, but it ends up saving the patient. And often the case will be, I don't know, I just it just felt right. Well, where did you get that feeling? It came from years and years and years and years of practice. And um, I was mentioning last night with you guys, you know, you're the human brain with around 80 to 8, 85 to 88 billion neurons, 70 percent of them are in the cerebellum, which is this lobe in the back of your head, and that deals with movement. You know, some yeah. say that the whole brain was evolved just from movement alone. So you have to engage in practice, physical oh, practice okay. of these things. Yes, yeah, so it just shows that us looking at the world and how basically, you know, everyone has like a kind of sectarian divide in a sense. Like we're living in a society where everyone's just divided anyway. And there's like perceptions to things. And in life, there's an, a certain outlook on certain things that... Well, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, you would say, mm-hmm. or if it's like society's kind of built us towards that way. But what what's your take on that? Has religion got to do a part of that in terms of how the atheists perceive this? It's thing? tribalism. It's not religion. It's just we're tribal by nature, and that has to do with survival instinct and just yeah. uh, group preservation. And so, you know, you see that with families that the discussion we were having earlier about marriage and and just having families coming together and stuff i mean part of it is tribalism like you want to preserve the family in a particular way and so you start to put in arbitrary ridiculous rules about who your kids should marry or should not marry and so that's just part of tribalistic uh, behavior and all of it is it's just emotions it's raw emotions that are not justified rationally or religiously speaking even just to just to go on a tangent from that, would you say that tribal impulse that humans have is in, inherently sort of irrational? Because even as Muslims, we have a sense of the collective of the Muslim or yeah. sort of thing. Wouldn't wouldn't you say that's a form of tribalism that we keep to because we must sort of define ourselves against things that aren't Islamic? Do you mm-hmm. get what I mean? Yeah, I think that's a problem. Oh, you think that's <laughs> that, a problem? Yeah, okay, okay. okay. So, oh, you, well, yeah. so you're sort of more radical in that sense. What I don't like about it is because when you start to define yourself based on what others are doing, yeah, yeah. then you just become a byproduct of them anyways. And so that's a problem in itself. Rather than, okay. 
I define myself based on what Allah and His Messenger said. Oh, okay, so would you say how atheists sort of say all religious people have a mob mentality, but in that act of saying that they do, they're becoming a mob themselves. Yes, you get, yes, so they're becoming yeah, a mob themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, it's kind of a funny quirk of how these things work out. But um, yeah, and, and, and if you look at mob mentalities and sectarianism, it's very much condemned in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not be like those who disbelieved. Um, who d- divided their religion? Those who come before you and disbelieve and divided their religion and became sects. كل حزب بما لديهم فريحون. Every sect is joyous with what they have, and wow. it's interesting that Allah uses the you know the description فريحون فرح. It's like an emotional state of happiness and joyousness. Yeah. It's not a rational state to be in. So yeah, I don't. Okay. I, that's where the difficulty comes in because, um, uh, as you guys know, um, notice probably in the debate where uh, Peter. It was just like, I'm trying to figure out where we disagree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for a lot of Muslims listening uh, at the debate or the discussion that we had, they would have said like, where did you guys disagree? And I've had that experience. People come after it during the break and afterwards. I'm still trying to figure out where you guys disagreed. Mm. And it's because I was not approaching it with the, uh, with the perspective of, I'm here to refute some idea that you had. And it's interesting, mm-hmm. yeah, not, not how he started the whole discussion. You tell me first what you believe, yeah. and then I'll tell you why it's wrong. There is an intention there already in place, which tells me that you're, if you want to rephrase what he said, you tell me what you believe, and I'll rationalize why I'm going to say it's wrong. Rather than, let me examine what you believe, and see if it's logical. And that's why when I cornered him, and I said, listen, like, we need to like, delve into this a little bit. And, you know, just restricted him to saying, like, if these axioms are true, like, are they val- is what I'm saying valid and, r- and rational and deductively logical? Yeah. He was like, oh, yeah, it is. All right. Uh, like even so, him saying that I'm gonna go against like what you believe in, that in itself is mob mentality as well. Like that yeah. puts him in a certain category. Yes, anyway. you've already restricted your thinking. It's kind of yeah. that's why when people say like religion restricts your, th- you know, you're restricting science. No, man. I'm as expansive as it comes. I'm open to so many different things. But we mentioned, you know, if you open your mind up too much, your brains will fall out. So there are certain <laughs> yeah. things that we yeah. we have limitations for, but. I'm able to entertain many different ideas. Bring them on. My mind literally fell out last night. <laughs> Since you're down, I'm not even kidding. During the debate. But like, the discussion. It's, talking about the ideologies of atheists, in the sense of how would you, their justification for their beliefs is kind of through science. Most of the time from, I guess, me as a Muslim looking into how, what atheists, you know, why atheists believe in what they believe. But are we being harsh in the sense it's only purely materialism or science they're using? Or are they justifying kind of their belief system of no God through other means as well that we're not aware as Muslims? Well, basically? the number one that they're doing it through is implicitly through the indoctrination they receive through their education system. And if you go through the education curricula right now, and it doesn't matter what the subject is, not just science, any subject, the way that it's all being taught and the way that it's studied, it drives you to eventually formulate questions that are going to... The conclusion is almost, or the answer is almost in the question itself. Yeah. And so you're being trained to think like a materialist from a very young age. And that's the danger with the education system, right? So if the Muslim community doesn't have its own schooling... And when I say you're schooling, I don't mean just that you open a Muslim school and then that's it. I mean, you even interject within the curriculum development itself. You know, one of the points that was brought up was, and he just, it's funny that he just assumed that I'm going to come up with a cosmological argument and the argument from design when we talk about the existence of God. I was like, none of that is valid. (laughs) And he was just like, what do you mean none of it is valid? You know, and people just get shocked by that. How come you're not going to argue from there? It's like, I'm not going to argue from the lesser to the higher. Yeah. Nature, the creation to the creator. Yeah. I start off with the creator. And so you have to flip the script on all of this stuff and just approach it from a different perspective. Yeah. And that way, you know, I get, I get a question sometimes like, oh, what will it take for you? Uh, is there a, a chance for you to disbelieve at some point? It's like, you know what? The chance exists because my guidance is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and I hope that I stay on the right path and that's my hope. But if you, if you leave it up to me, no, there's no way. And that's not me being closed-minded. That's just oh. me using rational means to get to this conclusion that I have. Now for the atheists, yeah, it's not just science. They're using many, many things. It starts off with this education system, their life experience, the media. I mean, I mentioned um, at some point, for example, in the, in the U.S., I believe it was Gallup polls that released these numbers. And in a seven-year period, the support for same-sex marriage went into 
I, I think it was like something like 35% or something that were supporting same-sex marriage or something like that. Yeah. And before that, it was like in the low teens or low, low di- single digits mm-hmm. before the seven years. Something like that. You guys can go check it out. The point that I picked up from that, though, was when people were investigating, how did this public opinion change? What took place? Regardless of what you think about same-sex yeah. marriage, you know, how did the interesting question is, well, what happened? In seven, year, seven years, that's a very fast change in public opinion. And they noted that the media, for example, pop culture, had a massive role in shaping beliefs of people. So you have, now you're changing social s- uh, stigma a little bit and changing the pressures of conformity on people to accept certain things. So for the atheist, you're in academia, for example. <coughs> which is dominated by atheists, dominated by liberal left-leaning type of people. Your opinions, you either subconsciously pick them up, as the Prophet ﷺ says, The individual is always going to be upon the path or the religion of the one that they are. Khalilihi in Arabic literally talks about taking your fingers and interlocking them tightly. That's like, so talk about education and, and, and your yeah. work environment and academia. So that's who you're with. You'll, you'll either pick up their beliefs or you'll clash with them uh, because you just can't stand it. Either way, you're going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. So you have the intellectual in- environment. You had your previous education that you grew up with. You have the, public, uh, the popular media. You have the comedy realm. Comedians, I mean, it's just when you, when you take the sacred... Yeah, I've noticed the certain things they make fun of. It's yes. very pointed. As yes. in, why would you make fun of those things? As in, Yeah, well, you know what the consequences of you listening to a discourse that belittles religious figures, yeah. belittle, belittles God, belittles the sacred, desacralizes yeah. all of that stuff, you yourself begin to lose a sense of the sacred. Yeah, so definitely. So you have all of these things coming together and then you come and say, I'm an atheist because I'm a rational person. I don't think so. No. You know, or insult me by you know belittle my intelligence for saying you're only a believer because of your culture, yeah. as if you transcended your culture. culture yes. And plus, regardless of all of that, it's kind of peculiar. It's curious that both of us are able to transcend our culture and recognize our culture's influence on us. Well, uh, exactly. <laughs> it's like but, it's like self reflexive, isn't that yes. paradox? Yeah. Yes. In the sense, for me personally, that's why when I was going through a stage of, you know, non-practicing Muslim to becoming more practicing, I felt that you start to pick up as a Muslim growing up in the West where, you know, the media is on your, on your back, especially yeah. with the Muslim, you know, uh, this, that, terrorism, ISIS, and you're just like a terrorist all of a sudden. You know, mm-hmm. you just wanted to study at school and stuff, and all of a sudden you're labeled as a terrorist. My association. So on and on. <laughs> and um, just going towards that kind of, living in that society, and at the same time transitioning from high school to uni. And... I realized with all these cultural things and the stuff that you mentioned in the media, mm. indoctrinates people. And that's why my initial thought was, if there's a creator, it kind of overlooks all this kind of societal stuff, mm. right? It raises you to another level where you overlook inherent flaws in the society mm. or what are we coming to? Is society progressing? Is it regressing or whatnot? So it's funny how atheists are like, oh, you know, you've only been in the religion and that's why you think this. That's not true. Like you said in your talk yesterday, you come to conclusion with God first. And that was one of the ways I came to God first because then you can establish that, okay, there's this kind of objective morality in a sense. And then everything else, you discover which religion is true. Yeah. So I feel like atheists are indoctrinated to think like that, that religious people only stick by to their religion. Yeah. What's interesting about atheists is that they, they don't even uh, recognize their own indoctrination, which is the ultimate form of blindness. You, just, you don't see that you're in this position because of all of these different factors and pretend like you've, tra- you've transcended all of them, rose above it, and then came to your atheism yeah. by yourself. And it's funny that you ask a lot of, about their biographies <laughs> and you either find trauma when it comes to religion yeah. or no religious upbringing whatsoever. And then you want to tell me that that had no impact right, on your yeah. decision to be an atheist? And like, um, I think I read, I'm not too familiar with those exact philosophers of the 21st century, but I think someone like David Hume, you look at all the philosophers that were atheists, they had terrible history. Like in life, they were either like no marriage, just doing, you know, fornication here, there, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And they're like, Rousseau as well. they were like really yeah, yeah. bad people, like personally. So it's so weird yeah. how... As much as people, atheists say free thinking and, you know, we're all about love and this, that. Like, yeah, <laughs> like just come together, guys. These people were not good people in person. No, in, per- in their personal lives, they were not good people. And even the modern atheists that uh, promote, they, they talk about tolerance and love and all of that stuff. 
what they call for are very horrendous things. And if you look at their experience with religion, I mean, I just find it fascinating that someone like Richard Dawkins, for example, <coughs> admits that he was molested. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did not know about, I did yeah, not know yeah. about this. Wow. He was molested by his, I don't know, the, the pastor or something. The pastor or whatever. He oh, actually well. went through that. And then he says, oh, but that has nothing to do with why I'm an atheist today. <laughs> Whoa. Like, give me a break. Like, you have that traumatic experience that is linked with religion, linked with God, linked with all yeah. of that stuff. And then you want to tell me that has nothing to do with why you are so vehement and vicious and toxic with your anti-religion discourse? SubhanAllah. Yeah. yeah. Just touching on that, because Richard Dawkins is a biologist, do you think that science, before they became scientists, atheists, for example, do you think they held on to the belief that there was no God and they delved into the science? If Some of them can... do that. Some of them tell you that. But you can't reduce a human being into a single dimension and just yeah, say that's yeah, all yeah, they are, sure. right? Yeah. So... so there are many things that get people to do whatever that they're doing. But science is, uh, by and large, is uh, driven by curiosity. People are curious about something and they just feel very passionate about it. And they just go and investigate and try to figure out what, what's what. And maybe um, it's the scientific enterprise itself that make, creates their sort of atheistic beliefs. Or they could have brought that in before. Well, as, as a social institution, yeah, um, it's dominated by atheists right now. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just in this juncture in history, and that's the thing. Like if you if you look at historically, science has been dominated by all kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was dominated by pagans for a period of time. It was dominated by uh, Muslims for a period of time, and now it's just dominated by atheists for a period of time. So that tells you that the scientific enterprise itself and science, the progress of science, is not dependent on somebody's belief systems because all you're doing is you're investigating patterns in the world. Yeah, what yeah. it is dependent upon is uh, the ability of the human intellect to exercise its powers to investigate and, f and formulate theories and find patterns in nature and just, you know, apply, apply that knowledge in some beneficial way to, uh, in technology to progress and create a civilization out of it. But that's, that's not dependent on your belief system. And like, it's funny, it's because all the sci uh, atheists in this day and age, they feel like they have a monopoly. Okay, we have science, we have all this rationality, we have this, you know, this thing where it just kind of talks down on religion. So I feel like them doing that is a sense of pride and arrogance in a sense. They utilize that kind of medium, like which is science, in order to show to everyone else that they're better. And doesn't that, or like we ties back to well, the tribalism. You that, know what, that, that uh, I can say the same thing about Muslims that talk about uh, non-Muslims in the same way with regards to the Akhirah. And, you know, we are better than you and you're going to hell anyways. And, you know, we have this, the way that it's presented could be arrogant in itself. You have no right or business to do that. Your business is to call people to Islam and your business is to show the best foot forward yeah, and yeah. to explain things and you can't impose things on people. And But you know, knowing that salvation is through Islam and that's why you're doing it because out of concern for human beings and stuff, but you're not doing it because you feel like you've, uh, you have some right to something. Iblis is the one that thought he had some right to something yeah, and what did it end up, you know, he was yeah, up there and well. he got kicked out. You're not even there and you're trying to pretend like you're already there. Exactly. You know? So yeah, it's it's a tribalistic thing, and everybody thinks that they got something. And the the atheists, what they have is, because science moves. If you just look in history, it moves between different civilizations, regardless of their belief systems. All right, so belief system doesn't matter. Then what matters? If you want to look at uh, okay, scientifically speaking, application of it, the progress that it gives you. How are you applying it in nature? You can't subdue nature. You can't fight nature. Nature will always win. We're knowing that now. Nature is coming back at us with hurricanes and earthquakes and all kinds of stuff to let us know that reactions, yeah. that's just reactions. To it, yeah. You're not going to subdue it. All right. So what I see then is the belief system of atheism is very harmful to science in that sense because it okay. is instrumentalizing science in ways that go against divine order. As a consequence of that, we start to taste, as Allah says, I'll just, he'll just give us a taste of the corruption that has spread across the earth and the oceans. So when you look at global climate change, you look at the fish that's been gone, you look at all this stuff, that's how we're doing. The coral yeah, reefs yeah. that are dying, the Arctic circle that is shrinking. It's like lot, yeah. That's atheists doing science, if for lack of a better word. That's atheists thinking that nature is all there is. That's atheists thinking that nature is indifferent to you. That's atheists applying their science to the world. as in Without concern exactly, yeah. to the world, without concern to divine will, without concern to divine commandments to preserve this, yeah. without concern to any of that stuff. So if you ask me, it's pretty bad that atheists are doing science, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like even according to their own principles then, so 
their morality would usually boils down to a matter of maximizing pleasure and minimizing harm for the most amount of people. Yeah. Even if you want to apply that to the science they've accumulated to this point and how they're using it to run the world, they it falls back on them as in the climate change they've created as in this is going to drastically impact people's lives for the worse. Yeah. At this point. So it's I don't know they See the 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 reason for that is because when you don't have a transcendent moral compass. Yeah, yeah. Above all of that stuff, your perception of maximizing benefit and minimizing harm, utilitarianism is going to be very provincial and time bound mm-hmm. and it's not going to look at the big picture of things. Yeah. And it's funny how when they do it, every time scientists do something, uh, th- their approach to doing things right now is let's do it now and figure out the consequences later, how to deal with the consequences later. Yeah. This helps us for now. So, um, yeah, yeah, I feel like it sort of falls into <clears throat> the global economic factors as well, like the drive for capitalism, like to create more profit as in science as in like the pharmaceuticals industry for example as in yeah the the work they do all that is just unchecked unhinged human beings who are without a moral compass yeah. that restrains them trying to gain the most out of this world <laughs> thinking that they are here for one time and one time only so, and they just want to get the most out of it and that's all yeah there is something called you know just to have rida that you don't have to accumulate billions upon billions of dollars Those, for example yeah. we know actually psychological research shows us very clearly once you pay your bills once your necessities of life are taken care of making more money does not make you more happy in fact it can add to your stress it's like science has already shown that so yeah yeah. we already know that stuff so what is this chase after (coughs) billions of dollars all the time it's and i'm not saying don't go chase after that stuff i'm just saying like put it in perspective if you look at the biographies of the companions The Prophet ﷺ was rolling with Fortune 500. <laughs> Small, yeah. Straight up. Like, if you, like, he was, they were very rich. And there were not numbers on a screen. There were plots of land, gardens, oh. cattle, camel, gold, yeah. silver. They had so much wealth. Like Abu Sufyan got, when he converted, he got so many like cattle and stuff. He became that, a millionaire. That's like the smallest example. Yeah. Like, there's some of them, it's just the amount of money. And when you convert it, like Uthman bin Affan, Umar al Khattab, Abu Bakr Siddiq. Everybody was rich. They had money, like no tomorrow. <laughs> but when you look at their lives, if you didn't know this, people get surprised when I say this stuff. And they're like, what? They had like, really? Like yeah. some of them would get like a thousand dinars a month or something. That's really interesting. That's how do you, because when you read their biographies, they weren't living it up. Yeah. Their lifestyles didn't Their lifestyle did not yeah. attest to the wealth that they had. And for them, it was just something in their hands that yeah. they recognized. At the end of the day, you're going to go to the grave and you're not taking any of it with you. There are more important things in life than making money. Family is more important. Definitely, you know? yeah. The environment is more important. Mm. Your duty to your community is more important. There's more important things that humanity is more important than you making money. So the way that capital, unchecked capitalism works, that's why I don't like just even attributing uh, to capitalism per se. It's just unchecked, unhinged, without a moral compass. You just go about, collect all you can, as much as you can, as fast as you yeah. can, because you think this is it. You have, I know, YOLO. <laughs> yeah. Right, this is all you yeah, got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, like, someone I like just to add to that, you just you just clearly remind me of an instance in the Sira where Prophet Muhammad and his companions like uh, accumulated so much wealth. I think it was from I don't know which war in particular, but he was distributing it to everyone, like to new converts, and he gave a million dollars to Abu Sufyan and all all of the other companions. And then there's the Ansar who literally been there from day one, struggling, hustling, been there through everything. And he didn't give them a single penny. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, yo. And then they they got cut a bit, right? They were yeah. just like, what's going on? Like, you know, we struggle so much. And you're giving these guys who literally converted yesterday, like, millions of dollars. And you don't give us anything. And Prophet Muhammad gave them a big moving, like, kutbah about, you know, aren't you happy that they only got material wealth, whereas you got the Prophet Muhammad yeah. on your side. And yeah. like that, yeah. you know, everything you just said, just like, just remind me of yeah. that kind of yeah. instance. So it just shows this world is like, it can't be, you can't gain kind of happiness from that material wealth. Yeah. That's why, but keep in mind, because even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul man haram Allah li Like, uh, say, who's making haram the zina, the adornments of this world that he has brought forth for his servants? So it's okay, it's perfectly fine for you to, you know, you want to drive a Ferrari, go for it. Like, it's fine. You want to, you know, and I would recommend don't buy it. Rent it. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you want to waste that money? Yeah. Just rent mm-hmm. it and drive it for a little bit and then move move on. Absolutely. Uh, it's a bad investment. Cars are a bad investment. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say here. Um, you want to have a, live in a nice house, live in a nice house. You know, you want to have some finer things in life. That's all right. Imam Malik himself, 
رضي الله عنه he what what happened with him a man comes to him who is like a an ascetic man you know he was just like fasting all the time you know one piece of clothing that he has that's like all patched up and he tells him Malik because he was noticing that he was like he was all about his perfumes and he was all about his like nice turbans and stuff yeah, and yeah. his clothing and you know Imam Malik the Gucci and you know like that's <laughs> what you know <laughs> I think, day, you know yeah. Gucci was there <laughs> yeah, yeah. and what did he say I was like Allah opens different doors you know this is for me I, but he recognized like uh, this is I'm not attached to these things the idea here is that if tomorrow somehow something happens la qadr Allah may Allah preserve us all mm-hmm. you just lose all of your material wealth you end up yeah. on the street are you still going to be okay you want to get to a position spiritually speaking that subhanallah Allah gives and Allah takes away and just adding to that like that reminds me of from us so I'm like so I'm listening to Yasika the Sira and he goes on about how in during times when Prophet Muhammad had like no kind of belongings, personal belongings, he would have yeah. just perf- you'd spend the most money just on perfume, simply not because for himself, just for the people, it's, for the community. Yeah, so yeah. it links back to if you don't have everything, uh, it doesn't mean that you'll be sad or anything. It's mm. about the community, the sense yeah. of the community, and the people around you. There's yeah. more to this world than just like that materialistic kind yeah. of outlook. As in, you'd be materialistic for the sake of other people, sort of thing. As in, exactly. perfume benefits other people. I think that's the yeah exactly, yeah. and just basically. I wanted to add on top of the topic we're talking about in terms of science. And do you think that this effect of the multi-billion dollar companies and all that, we didn't have this phenomenon back in the times of the mm. you know, Islamic golden age or other kind of areas where they were developing science? Or is this like a very new phenomenon that it's kind of changed? It's not science. So you know how we before we were saying science was with them, now science was this group and science yeah, is yeah. with like the atheists now. But is it the same kind of science? Do you think a different framework sort of bears yeah. upon all of that? Like, how were Muslim scientists doing science in a way that was different? Like what was their kind of, like, motivation? Because for what we're seeing, kind of, there is a materialistic gain from doing science in this present... Well, if you look at a lot of the Muslim works, uh, the early Muslim works, the, the primary motivation for doing their science was to fulfill religious duties. That was the number one thing. Yeah. And then from that, you have also the interest in Allah's creation. That you, you have this curiosity that is... For a lot of people, you... you find out that it's more innate you know they just feel it they're like i just want to know about this okay you know yeah. when you ask me for example like why are you doing this and stuff yeah. it's just it's, it's something that's driving me because i want to understand it and the reason i want to mm. understand it is because i'm fascinated by Allah's creation in yeah. this aspect and so that's what i'm going after um so that's that's really it for a lot of scientists in uh, Muslim. So you, you could uh, in back in back Muslim then. times yeah. nowadays you have people that are genuinely interested, and you they still want have to those serve. people. Yeah. You have those people, and they don't have. They can be atheists too. I mean, yeah. they, they just they have a. The fitra is a powerful force. Yeah, yes. you know, is what I'm trying to get to. It's yeah. Yeah. the fitra is an amazing thing. The fitra is what unites us as humans. Mm. And had it not been for, the, been for the fitra, man, we'd be just like I don't know if you watch these National Geographic chimps. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. nice. well, we came from the word evolution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, well. The thing is, human beings behave in that way sometimes, if you notice it. You know, if you, just watch these videos, these chimps when they expand their territory. And they, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, man, because they, they will plan out an attack, they will go in and they'll do that and they'll kill the other tribe and they'll. And it's just about material gain. Human beings act just like that if they don't have a transcendent source um, to kind of keep that in check or if they didn't have the fitra to keep that in check. So, so the fitra you're saying it's that natural the disposition fitra, that okay the like. fitra allows us to be humans with each other and to uh, coexist and not yeah. kill each other like chimps do that's what the fitra does the transcendent moral compass Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept that as a free will thing there's yeah. no imposition on that so if you say without religion we're all going to descend into becoming chimps and like that. Yeah. That's wrong because you're negating the fitra's role and stopping that. Yeah. It's not just about Islam. It's there's, not just about still Islam. something inside there's human still beings, something yeah. Inside, yeah. And that's why you see like when people come up with the uh, Declaration of Human Rights and they come yeah, up with all these like different... That. What motivates people to do good in the world? Yeah. Uh, you can't say that it's, oh, it's Islam and therefore... Uh, I mean, if you want to say that, then you have to explain how come Muslim countries are bombing other Muslim countries yeah. in smithereens yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and how come non-Muslim countries are telling Muslim countries not in Ramadan guys <laughs> <laughs> wow. that, that's actually pretty grim that actually yeah, happened really. Tillerson the Secretary of State for the United yeah, States, United States yeah. he tells the Saudis when they blockaded Qatar in Ramadan you have a non-Muslim coming to them and saying 
Come on, guys. <laughs> Not in the holy month of Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> so, where is the Islam in that? <laughs> so, and just, do you think that idea of the fitra is atheists recognize on a like kind of universal sense that it's within humans? That's their. That's the. That's the power of their uh, presence. That's where they get the power for their presence. Why, why they're sustained? Because if, if the fitra was not there, you would not have atheists. Because if it was really just about utilitarianism, if there was no moral compass, yeah. and there's no fitra, we will descend into just very aggressive animal behavior that's just dealt with preservation of tribe, and that's yeah. it. But because of the fitra, subhanAllah, it allows us to exist in a way that keeps us civil and engage with each other and call each other to Islam or to whatever system we want to call for without killing each other at the same time. And leaves Islam in the realm of free will where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says La ikraha fi deen, allowing people to choose for themselves yeah. so that they can get the reward or the punishment later and does the fitra distinguish us from the rest of the animals so the rest of the animals doesn't have that fitra that we have and that's why we're human that's what that's part of what makes us human that's, that's what defines us yeah because yeah. you don't see that in the animal world to a large degree I don't want to say completely because I haven't seen all of the animal world mm-hmm. you might see some things in the animal world that <laughs> The idea, so the, the sense of justice, for example, is present in the animal world. They recognize that. Fitra is something else, something that transcends all of that stuff. It has a supra-rational aspect to it that goes beyond material here and now sense of justice. It has a, the transcendent sense, sense of justice is in the fitra. But the material sense of justice is just part of your brain. And you, how did then suddenly, if you look from the atheistic point of worldview, you know, with them believing theory of evolution that, okay, we're evolving from, you know, soils to animals to humans. Suddenly from that transition from chimps to humans, suddenly we had that fitra just click in. Is there any kind of, ju- like, that's where I feel from my kind of Muslim uh, worldview that they can't have an explanation for that. Or have they even come to explain that? They come up with, as in the words of Peter, when he says, there are some really good theories about this stuff. <laughs> so... so I mean, the human intellect is a very powerful thing, and it can come up with a lot of theorizations about a lot of things. The question becomes, can you prove any of it? I mean, just to touch on the theory of evolution, for example, just to show you how messed up this is, what people think what it is and what it actually is and how it played out with regards to the evolution of man and how we progress and stuff. Every time you see an article about evolution, it's always accompanied with pictures, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's always just pictures of this chimp looking thing and then it progresses into some neanderthal looking thing and then it progresses into like some human like looking thing and then finally you get homo sapiens and you have these pictures and then they say we've discovered it's called that changes our story of evolution and then they drop another chimp looking thing and then (laughs) right and so that's always the case that's how they present it the problem with this is that it creates a false perception of how this thing progressed number one nobody's ever witnessed any of this nobody's seen any of these things happening it's it's a conjecture about how it happened based on isolated skeletal findings where you have people that study this they have a background in science but they're artists so they use the contours of the skulls and they use the the way that it's put together and and they create this image and then they have a family of chimps running in the field and then they say look this is your ancestors but you don't know that you don't know what they did and how they lived and how many of them were there and how it worked out and the dynamics and it all of that is just theorizations upon theorization, hypothesization is what we should say, upon hypothesizations based on some isolated findings to come up to the conclusion that this is how it worked out all the way till now. But none of it is actually confirmed anything. And that, that just reminds me of the verse in the Quran. It says the non believers will only follow conjecture. I was just going to mention the verse. <laughs> Sorry, that's, I'm cutting you off. No, that's, it's <laughs> like good that you're right. Ra- yeah. It's good that you're running to that conclusion that. That conjecture does not substitute for truth anything. So they have a lot of conjectures. Great, fine. So okay, what do you, how do you approach it then from a Muslim perspective? So don't theologize any of this stuff. Don't believe it. You can just say like, all right, this thing works for now. It's, this is the language of the age that they're using. I don't have to believe any of it. I just accept yeah, yeah. this is the, the, the paradigm and the discourse that's being used is as such. And it's working right now, practically speaking, in the scientific realm. It's allowing us to progress in some way. But that's not to say that it's not going to change. And so I don't make a big fuss about it. It is what it is. And it's just weird how 
us as humans, we can look down to saying, you know, our oh, chimps, we grew out of chimps, were superior than chimps. But we won't trust the consciousness of a chimp, right? So when we come up with conclusions and theories and stuff, we're using our own kind of rationality and consciousness. Yeah. So who's to say that we can trust our own consciousness? From an atheistic point of view, of course. So You can't trust it because if you are... Um, the atheistic worldview is a materialistic worldview, which says that, um, let's say, your thoughts are the byproduct of your brain function. All right. Well, if your brain function, which is impacted by just normal physiology, is going to change... That means your thoughts should change also. And if that's the case, then I shouldn't trust what you say to me now or five minutes later. Uh, you know, your yeah. glucose levels, if they drop a little bit, your brain activity changes. And if mm. it changes because of lack of ATP and lack of neurotransmitters, and so it moves, it changes things. Okay, so if it changes that, then you have actually, you see in the medical development, the, the pathological development of this, the clinical presentation you have loss of intellectual power, you have like, changes of thought, you have delirium, you have all of these things. So if somebody's going through that, then I can't trust, it. and that's more manifest example. Mm. But if I just say, have a cup of coffee, and then all of a sudden you're in a different state because you've become alert with uh, some sort of stimulant, your thoughts might change then. It just leaves me in this perpetual, never-ending position of never being able to trust anything you say because your thoughts are a byproduct of physiological activity, which changes all the time. If I talk to you in the morning, you're going to be in a different, just the circadian rhythms alone, you know, depending on when hormones are being released. That's going to change your thoughts. But we don't see that. What we see is despite all of these changes that take place in your biological being, your thoughts are remarkably consistent. So you're saying there has to be some foundational basis for our consciousness to sort of hack. There's back. something that's supra physical about <laughs> consciousness. Yeah, yeah. it's because if you just physical. look at the physical as you just outlined, as in there's always this instability, as in what is it that yes. holds this like mind or not mind, yeah. but like our consciousness, our yes. existence together, yes. sort of thing. So, so and they have no real explanation. For there's that. no it's explanation theory, for yeah. that. There's just theories about how it comes about. But if you really dig into it and say, all right, so you came up with like you know, I'm not a physicist, but I know this about physicists. String theory has no empirical proof at all. Yeah, it's just, it's a, just a rationalization. It's just a rationalization to try to come up with an explanation for why we're here and how we're here. And, yeah. and if you think about it, they're engaged in a lot of mythology making. You know, they, okay, accuse, yeah. they accuse religious people like, oh, it's just myths, myths of the past. Asatir yeah. al It's like, you're making myths right now. <laughs> You're just making it sound like theories. Yeah, yeah you're just using big words. <laughs> Myths according to your own methods. Of yeah. Like equations. That's stuff, it. Yeah. And yeah, you might have some things that are true to say about the world just from your ability to apply them technologically. Yeah. But beyond that, I'm just, you know, I, I take us back to Imam al-Ghazali and the incoherence of the philosophers <laughs> where he just mentions, you know what, like when it comes to your science, I don't have a problem with you. Yeah, and yeah. even Islam, Islamically speaking, there's nothing wrong with what you're saying. You know, it's, we're neutral to it. Not agnostic, neutral. Ah, yeah. It works, could change, whatever. But for you to start philosophizing and creating world views out of it afterwards, now I have to put a red line and say, this doesn't work anymore. And I'm not being anti-scientific about it. I'm just being anti-philosophy uh, about anti it. Anti-speculation. You know? Anti-speculative about anti, it. Anti-science like science trying to go where it shouldn't really yes. go. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah, these are the speculations and the ruminations of anti-theists and atheists who just want to preserve some sort of uh, mystery about the yeah. transcendence without having to acknowledge the transcendence. Yeah. And do you think that's the mistake that basically atheists do looking at the world? So for a Muslim, we put on, we've, after we've established the Islam, the truth and whatnot, we look through the Muslim lens of looking at the world and we say, oh, wow, look at the trees that must, Allah must have created and look how beautiful mm. it is. Whereas the atheists look at the world and we also have that spiritual realm as well whereas mm. the atheist may go into looking at the world from a materialistic scientific lens mm. do you think that lens initially is the mistake because they're trying to justify non-material things through material means yeah is that like a real issue do you think do you think that's like the starting point of where they're kind of making the mistake or are they justifying what they kind of using well they they start off with uh, the, the you know the interesting thing about keeping things in the free world realm for you to believe or not believe is there has to be you know this one lady asked yesterday uh, she was troubled by the leap she said oh, the leap to, to faith the leap to faith the leap of faith that yeah. you have to make yeah. she didn't like that she wanted to but the thing is you always are making leaps of faith on a daily basis about a lot of things the biggest so leap true. of faith that you're making is that you're believing the scientists right yeah 
I just that's the interesting thing that I didn't mention yesterday. I wanted to retort, but it was just short of time with Peter. When I when he said, you know, when I was talking about uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography and what we know about him and what we know about the Quran <coughs> that even non-Muslims attest to, they say like this is not disputable. And then he says he doesn't want to believe that. You know, how do you believe all of this stuff? Uh, well, how do you believe all the scientists are telling you the truth? Like, yeah. why are you believing them and not believing this? Like, he, it's just interesting the selective, you know, being selective with this or that. So the lens that the atheists will use, despite them using that lens, they're still seeing beauty in the world, still marveling at it, still having curiosity about it. The questions become about the uh, meaning derived from these observations. What does it mean? Yeah. And the meanings that they derive from it are just a byproduct of the initial position that they had, yeah. which is actually independent of the world itself. It's just that they, they have a position. The position is God does not exist. The world is beautiful. Let me come up with a substitute for God, nature, yeah. with a capital N, instead of a God with a capital G, nature with a capital N, and I'm just going to use that as God. And if you notice the way they talk about nature, it's they're talking about God. Would you say that's embedded in how human beings just think? Like we have to articulate like an eternal presence of some sort, not eternal. Yes, I mean, yeah. Sort of like over and above us. It's definitely innate to us and we cannot get away from it. And so it just becomes a matter of do I force it and come up with rationalizations away from it? Yeah. Or do I just acknowledge it and go, it's funny that scientists will talk about the simplest explanation. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the best explanation, the simplest explanation is Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is God, God. created it. <laughs> that's the simplest explanation. Yeah. They don't want that explanation. They want a very complicated, complex explanation that uses a lot of different uh, jargon, technical jargon. And through the use of technical jargon, yeah. You actually, what you do when you use technical jargon is you create a barrier for the layperson to even make a judgment about whether what you're saying is sensical or nonsensical. And that's what the Christians back in the times during the church, conflict between the church and the public, when they released like their gospels, they had all of it and they want to release it to the public. I feel like that's the same as the paradigm in science oh, at the yes. moment, where they're hiding all the like, yeah, look, just believe us. We, we say this, yeah. evolution's true, da, 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 as we aren't exposed yeah. to, okay, give us the actual mm. proofs and make it, dumb, dumb it down for us, basically. Yeah. Like make us in so layman can understand. Yeah. That makes sense. So some, that's where popularizers come in. But yeah. the, the problem with science popularizers is that they're very pick and choose over what they say. Yeah. And when they uh, popularize science, they do it with their ideology in mind as well. So Bill Nye, the science guy, for example, or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any of yeah. these figures, when they go out and they try to promote science, <coughs> and stuff, they're doing it from an atheist perspective. Yeah, definitely. But if I come to you and tell you just Islamically speaking, you know, I can describe so many different things for you yeah. and link it back to Islam and you'll just marvel. Be like, wow. And, and that's you still leave. science. At the end of it's the still yeah. science. I'm not... Yeah. Saying not anything, anything nonsense, yeah. I'm not changing anything. I'm still engaged in the scientific yeah. process and the scientific method. But now you're marveling at it mm. as Allah's creation as opposed to look at what quote unquote yeah. nature did. Yeah. Exactly. Strong. It's like there's so much else you bring when you're talking about science that yes. imbues your language of how you yes. speak about science. Yes. In, and obviously their baggage is all materialism, atheism, yeah. Like any lack of recourse to anything higher. Yeah. That's all they are. So you know how you touched on like nature and they use na they put the capital N on nature from your logical like the points you made last night was that you have to either say God was always existing mm -hmm. or you have to say nature was always existing and isn't that a conundrum for the atheists because you know if they're trying to explain the Big Bang doesn't that mean that it's not true that the, the universe like they're trying to prove that universe didn't have a beginning that's the only way to kind of get around the fact that God doesn't exist, if that yeah. makes sense. But you're, you no, it's, it's not the only way. The thing is, the only way for them to, to get away from God not existing is to prove that the universe is eternal. Yeah. And that is an impossibility because just as us engaging in this conversation, we're, we're engaged in change. And as it changes, that automatically means it's not eternal. By definition, well, anything that changes is not eternal. So the, what they're trying to do is to prove the impossible. It's an irrational position. Being an atheist is an irrational position to be in. Basically, we as non-atheists, we're trying to look at the, the world about its creation and coming to conclusions by looking at around like the world and how it could have, and postulate basically. Whereas I feel like what the atheists are doing is that they're using those, you know, axioms, using it on mathematics and then using those mathematics on science, then looking back at the creation, if that makes sense. So it's like a yeah, double so, layering lensing. Yeah, so, they, so what they're doing is they're using the principles of pure reason 
that bring about mathematics, <coughs> which is used to prove scientific findings. And they're rejecting the use of pure reason, which is very legitimate use of pure reason, to arrive at the conclusion that God exists and that Muhammad is a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and so they, it's funny that they pick and choose between what they want and what they don't want. And when you start to see people picking and choosing, you now know that you're not dealing with rational people. You're dealing with rationalizers. And at the end of the day, like you brought up that point about mathematics, that it's basically an ID. It's, you know, it could be just you write one plus one, two is on the board, but it's just, it's just yeah. numbers on like a board. And like that was, I found that point really profound because that shows that, okay, if mathematics was a, is an abstract uh, means of looking at something our consciousness has to interpret that yeah but they can't justify hey what if consciousness or rationality is irrational how like they're assuming they're on the assumption that's why that's like, like that axiom. question that came up with the guy was like what, me, what if i'm just really skeptical why don't you be yeah, skeptical yeah. about your own skepticism then if you want to be really skeptical well it just it's like a never-ending it's a never-ending of... thing and so it, yeah i mean just to keep in mind though like i so that we're not giving the wrong impression to people Majority of atheists don't even engage in any of these discussions. They're just living their lives, you know, drinking their beer on the weekend and, <laughs> and going to the nightclub. They and don't look just, that deep know, into the They don't really the investigate. Philosophy. They're just yeah. living. They're just living, living and doing their own old. thing. And then you ask them, like, what do you believe? And it's like, ah, oh, bro, I don't know, nothing. Science. You know? Science. Like, Science. I have a personal, personal story about this. I had, like, one or two friends, uh, Muslim, and they basically said they're agnostic or atheists. Yeah. And I've had a few experiences, but a few friends that I even know I thought they were like kind of getting there non-practicing but you know the striving yeah, like we yeah, all have yeah. that phase in life yeah. but actually saying hey I'm agnostic is a big deal to me yeah, I was pretty shocked yeah. Yeah. but I just asked them so why I slightly just delved into the question of you know why this that why did mm. you come to a conclusion it's like don't talk to me about this bro I'm like do you what? know why do you know why <laughs> no no idea <laughs> it's freaking inferiority complex galore presenting itself to you I know a lot of Muslims don't like to hear this, like not ex-Muslims. They don't like to hear this. But the fact is, it's unpopular for you to be a Muslim right now. And it's unpopular for you to be religious and a believer right now. And you gain a lot of social capital when you say, I'm agnostic, bro. There's so much social capital to be gained Definitely. from saying that. And it helps you so much. Though. It helps you so much. It helps you in your career. It can help yeah. you in your social life. It can help you go drinking and partying and doing whatever you want. It can help you go live with your girlfriend. It can help you do anything you want without any checks and balances. Yeah. No restrictions, no consequences, nothing. So when you, you're you just merely trying to engage in an intellectual yeah. discussion. But for this friend of yours, it was an intellectual discussion. There is a lot at stake. Exactly. Yeah. And there's desire it plays so much. Yeah. yeah. And people are, you know, there is an interesting phenomenon in neurology. It's called neglect. And it happens to people that get a stroke, for example, uh, in the right hemisphere. You can get a stroke and it can paralyze your left arm. But the way that the position of the stroke is in the, the region, you start to not even recognize your arm. So it's your arm. Ooh. It's there, sitting on the bed. And so the physician can come in and say, lift, lift your arms for me. So the patient will lift the right arm, but they won't lift the left arm. Then you ask, why don't you lift the left arm? Because it's not my arm. It's your arm. It's the doctor's arm. It's the nurse's arm. It's not my arm. This arm. I woke up this morning and I saw this arm on my le on my bed and I don't know where it came from. What? So they don't even acknowledge They that. don't even acknowledge that this is their <coughs> arm. This they is lose the a sense of having a, a left. Yes. Um, neglect. That's, that's, that's next level. That's but it's yeah. there. Okay. That's kind of like inferiority complex with ex-Muslims that leave Islam and then they don't want to talk about it. And then when you bring it up, they say, I don't feel it. I don't have that. Uh, you know, and they start to get angry about yeah. it. And it's neglect. They're experiencing a form of neglect or they're trying to project some sort yeah. of neglect syndrome that yeah. I'm only an atheist or an agnostic because this doesn't make sense. Yeah. No, no, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense to you. Your problem yeah. is another problem. Yeah. It's like, why, why won't they even entertain the intellectual discussion? Like, yeah, if yeah. they had actual rational problems with Islam and its practices, then you can talk it through, right? Social scientists have studied this. The reason people turn into atheism most of the time, it's a social reason. Yeah. It's a social phenomenon. It's not an intellectual wow. phenomenon. Yeah. And like, I like to tell people, like when I'm talking to like <coughs> my Muslim buddies, like atheists, they do worship and it's just desires. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like yes. they worship something. Yeah. Allah says that. All right. Do you see, do you not see the one who takes their uh, God as their own desires? So, yeah, man, it's... um. Whatever it's, uh, yeah, they, it's they can, real. they can. It's, it's real. It's social phenomenon. Um, sohba is really important. Your companions are really important. 
So if you surround yourself with a bunch of atheists, sooner or later, they're going to overpower you. There's an interesting experiment in psychology um, that they did. They had uh, three subjects come in. I can't remember the name of the author, but it was done, I believe, in the 60s. And um, what he did was he drew three lines. Two lines were equivalent in length, and one line was longer than the other two. And two of the subjects were moles. They were hired. And one was the actual test subject. The two subjects that were moles were instructed to say that all three lines are equal. The one subject was the actual test subject who didn't know would just answer however they perceived it. So initially, the two subjects would say all three lines are equal. The one subject would say, no, no, they're not. The middle yeah. line is longer. <clears throat> and so the two subjects would insist, no, they're equal. They would have a little bit of a fight about it, but more cases than not, a very significant percentage of the test subjects that were being tested changed their minds yeah. and accepted that maybe the three are equal. And it's just me not seeing it. Even though objectively, the middle line was longer. Nothing changed. And that's because social pressure. So, sohba, your companionship, companionship yeah. is so important. Surround yourself with a bunch of atheists. Sooner or later, you're going to have doubts creep in. And you're going to start to buy what they say to you. Allah says, bil makru layli wa nahar. When, the, when the disbelievers talk to other disbelievers in hellfire on the day of judgment, they say, you brought us here. And they say, no, you had your own free will. You brought yourselves here. And so the retort back will be, no, it was your day and night, every day and every night, you saying the same thing to us back again, back again, back again, until you made an wow. influence on so, us. That's why we're here. So, so you like, got to pay attention to who you hang out with. It's like atheists, they maintain this image of like self-sufficiency, that I'm independent, it's my own rationality that's bringing about my choices. I don't think so. Whereas... That's not a valid way to view society, as in... The only way that you're independent like that is if you go live in a forest by yourself. Yeah. Like, like honestly, like, from my own experiences, I feel like when I had that phase of, okay, I went schooling, and I was a Muslim by culture, but I was surrounded by just all faiths, and we didn't really talk about faith. It was a very basic yeah. level kind of conversation. Hey, oh, what's up? Let's play sport, da, da, yeah, da. Yeah. That was like, and I felt <laughs> like, me, I was always, an, I was cultured into being an extrovert, and I, I really was at one point in my life. And, you know, you just conform to everyone. You just want to be that cool guy. You want to, you know, do every, everything. You know, even rebel against your parents because you want to conform mm. to society. That's literally what I went through and I've experienced it. Yeah, yeah. But once it hits you, you know, I had a kind of transition from high school to university and experiencing how temporary life is. Yeah. I cut myself away from those friends. I spent a mm. lot of time by myself. But I literally just had to rationalize and think for myself yeah. and I actually concluded, you know, believing in God through that kind of just being by myself. Yeah. So I think mm. like you're saying atheist, it's not like an atheist would do that, if that mm. makes yeah. sense. From what I've kind of experienced mm. or I mean it, you can't generalize completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People have different experiences. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so now I guess to sort of, sort of um, shift gears a little bit, Tanzim had his whole wanted to grill Dr. Gilan on science. That's not the only thing Dr. Gilan studies oh, and really has devs. quite an expectation. <laughs> like, I follow your, um, your podcast and your lectures online and I know that you've got quite an interest in understanding of philosophy. Yeah. Not just about science, but generally as well. And you've talked about it quite a bit. Like in your recent Mad Mom Looks interview, you're talking about the different isms and how philosophy is not trying to answer the the what of life but rather the how how mm -hmm. you should live that sort mm -hmm. of thing and i wanted to sort of bring us back to that discussion and specifically you were talking about things like post-structuralist post-modern thought mm. i'm an arts major so this mm. stuff sort of concerns me like i wanted to understand like how as muslims should we grapple with these sort of things and it's not completely re irrelevant to our previous discussion about atheism like mm. how do we how do we grapple with these new ideas and thoughts that emerge in society are they completely useless to us well, I guess atheism is, <laughs> but I'm talking about more so things like postmodernism, power knowledge, things like feminism, like yeah, in yeah. general. Like, how as Muslims are we meant to determine its usefulness or sort of? So atheism of is not totally useless because it triggers you into thinking about oh, I your guess, own yeah, yeah. So there's a use. <laughs> atheism to has that benefit. It has a benefit, right? Yeah, so yeah. You start to you wouldn't be questioning things and you wouldn't yeah. be engaged uh, critically with your religion if you didn't have that challenge from outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, the same thing with all of these different things, you know, if feminists have points to make that are valid. There's nothing wrong with you to, you know, all right, that's a valid point. If there's abuse, there is some sort of inequality with regards to equal work, you know, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. We don't have a problem with that stuff. The problem we have, for example, with, let's say, feminism, 
is the idea of the negation of equivalent yet not similar duality of gender that you know it's like the, in Chinese cosmology the yin and the yang you know they're not the same but they're equivalent in what they contribute 50 50 yes, contribution yes. but it's not the same type of contribution so it's this reduction of gender into the same yeah that they're both exactly the same and they're not the same so in that sense, uh, what, it, what it allows you to do is that you start to maybe have some sort of... I don't like the initial reaction that we might have sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I feel of just like, like, oh, you know, this is something that is shocking to us. Therefore, yeah, yeah. it must be wrong. No, it might be right. Let's just investigate the claim that they're making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I like about the post-structuralist type of way of doing things, which is like the umbrella for all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Is it, it, it gets you to first break down the different influences of institutions and social structures that we have and look at how they're impacting your life as an individual or yeah. as a community. So yeah. there is a use for that, for you as a Muslim community, for us as a Muslim community to do that and engage in this stuff. And then, as the Prophet ﷺ said, al mu'min. Wisdom is the last property of the believer. Yeah. Wherever they find it, you, you have more right to it. Yeah. So... That's kind of just in a in a nutshell what I think is useful about these things yeah. is we need well, the problem is when we, when you don't engage in that I'm, I'm just struck by people like um, just recently in the Andalus book club we just finished Islam and liberalism and what he did in uh, Joseph Mas'ad what he did in that he used kind of this from uh, Foucault's archaeology of knowledge type of toolbox yep. right yep. where you just break down like how is this power structure created who benefits from it how is it perpetuated so the idea behind that work was to look at how islam has become defined vis-a-vis -vis liberalism and how that definition is being deployed and projected onto the rest of the world the muslim world especially yeah. and how muslims are being portrayed afterwards so the tool for that is to that's where it's good to use it where it's bad to use that tool or it's bad, where it gets bad is when you start to negate the idea of objective truth so, like with feminism, for example, they make some sort of great analyses of even Muslim problems in society, yeah. like how there are patriarchal sort of norms that disadvantage women, not only at things like the level of work you do, but even things like language and access to health, wealth, those sort of things. As in, do you think... So the question the I have to ask first of all, because I'm, I'm just... What is patriarchal systems? What does that refer to? What it refers to, I guess you could say it just... From a perspective of the initial mode of power, as in males have more power in society than uh -huh. females, right? Okay. And through that, they can determine the part, the institutions and uh -huh. the access to certain forms of, I don't know, whatever you call it, labor, wealth, or sort of... So why, why, why project that onto males per se? Because if you look in the US, for example, not in US, Australia, um, the indigenous population... And yes. the struggles that they have with regards to access to healthcare, to access uh, as to in that's, that's a different so mode of analysis. That, that's like race, like a racial analysis. Or but do you call that patriarchal then, or like is like as in the, so? What the, you're the, saying, what I'm trying to get to yeah, is yeah, that yeah. it's not necessarily a male thing or a race thing. It's a who is dominant thing at the time. Who is Rather, dominant? So right, so who? But I don't disagree with you there. It's like, what lens do you use to view that dominant group? Do you get what I mean? Yeah, but I don't vilify the whole group based on somebody having more power and just projecting it in a way that might be harmful to others. I don't vilify the whole group because of the action of the few who happen to instill these things. True. You can question. So that's my that's a problem there. Yeah, so to say, like all men are a problem, and you, by virtue of being a man, you cannot gain access to my experience at all whatsoever you can't even understand it because you are a, you know a patriarch I, I don't i don't like that stuff i i think it's better to just look at it rationally speaking from yeah. you know the way i would look at it is are women for example getting paid less for the same yeah. work that's a empirical question you have to study it empirically the fact is they're not women are paying just about the same as men for yeah. the same work if you ask yeah. that question properly and investigate the data if you just look at the general, for example, generally, just do women make less than men overall, you'll yeah. come up with the figure of the 76 cents to a dollar. That's if you just ask a general question. Yeah. But then if I restrict your question and say, let's be a bit more scientific. Same work. Do women get paid less? Same hours. Same everything. No longer is the case. That's not the case anymore. Yeah, I get When you. you do that. And the reason for it is because for men, the work that they engage in is... Sometimes it's the most dangerous work as men. They work longer hours. There, so there are all these factors that are involved. So now when I investigate that question, I'm not starting from the position of let's vilify somebody over what they're doing. It's, it's just I want to investigate this. So are women having less access to education? 
It happens to be that in some some cultures that's the case, and men are the ones doing it. But I don't vilify mankind. I just say this is a problem over there, and it needs to be res- resolved yeah. in some way. Like for me, from my perspective, it doesn't matter how much a man earns or a woman earns. Yeah. yeah. But it's a sense that I've read some stuff about it, and it's like at the end of the day, women end up getting more savings from the income of yeah. men, and on top of that consumerism within shops I get geared like I think something like 70 percent towards women women so yeah. it's like controlled by women but they don't realize that they're seeing it from no, the center no, no, you could say that subjects women because as in consumerism women. bears more heavily down on them because of expectations yes. created by society. but you can look at it both ways and say the shops and the factories are gearing yeah. towards women so they have this kind of power in a sense yeah. as well no and women don't have that power because who's running the show it's males that males. males running it so it's they're yeah. getting objectified yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, okay. it's like the Isn't creator of the thong bikini. Who was it? Man, well, I it's a French <laughs> well, mechanic. Guessing, oh, French mechanic. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> makes total sense. Yeah, that's what they do in their spare time. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what. And he received letters of admiration wow. from French men. They were so happy with his invention. <laughs> so really well, what's funny. the case there? Yeah. They were being objectified yeah. by men, right? So that's what I would question. So feminism for Muslims to engage in that. It's a philosophy built on postmodernist atheistic thought and by definition that negates gender. It's not looking for gender parity. It's looking to reduce it to the same, that we yeah, are yeah, the same yeah. as men. And so from that you have these, you know, it, it's actually from that philosophy arose all of this now modern idea of the 70 gender pronouns and you can just fluidity and yeah. not having... Obviously we'd have to describe it that as in that's... Yeah. yeah, so that's a problem for us. But if they offer us some criticisms, if they have some takes that we can... Under, that we yeah, can I meant more so the problems we have in society. Like gender pay gap, I don't think that's nearly as much of a problem as things like oppression or domestic violence per se. Yeah. Or how men get away with certain things. But that's something that Muslim scholars have talked about as well, way before these feminist movements. <laughs> really? Look at the well, tafsir, is, man. Yeah, yeah. Tafsir, the Prophet ﷺ himself. This stuff was... We do, yeah. Yeah, we have it in our tradition. The problem is our tradition is not taken holistically by everybody. You know, people, if you're not conscious of your behavior, you end up in the pick and choose category. And so if you pick and choose, you'll just pick whatever benefits you and justify it however you want. But if you look at it holistically and look at what the scholars have said about these things, it's not like, you know, you have figures coming today with something new. Scholars talked about these things. Now, if your attention is being turned to it because somebody today said it, that's fine. As in re- renewing this, renewing this, this inquiry, yeah, into this the inquiry impression. into yeah, the, yeah and yeah. then you just look into it. But to think that Joseph Masad uh, treats in his book Islam and Liberalism is he shows how this oppression, for example, that is witnessed in Muslim communities, say towards Muslim women, what the West and feminism does is it Islamicizes it. So for us, it's like no, that's the problem. Yeah, but sometimes we, it's unfortunate. Because I've, but I've seen this. Some Muslims will try to justify the behavior Islamically. They will go along with it, and that's where the problem comes in. As that's because they're rejecting feminism wholesale. All yeah. of what you say is going to be rejected, and that means you're going to throw the baby with the bathwater, and so you'll end up perpetuating oppressive behavior because the original yeah. position you had was to reject the whole thing about feminism. I guess feminists would say that's like a patriarchal sort of. Um, Again, like I, this like term, move, like a reaction, yeah. like as in to maintain that, to maintain ha- how power. cultural Islam, yes. you could say, has been going about itself for the past. Yeah, but I, I again, I don't like the term patriarchal because it, okay, it implies, so you, yeah. I would question these terms off, uh, at the offset. You'd question our, our use of these terms? Not just our use, their use of, it, of these okay. terms. It's like, why are you assuming that it's negative? Okay. Well, when we say that patriarchy, like, are you talking about just having authority? Is Not that, just author- authority, but the misuse of it, like I was saying. As misuse in, there, of authority there is, there is bad. Is, there is supportive authority, as in you act as caretakers. Yeah. In, yeah, okay. But the, the problem I have with the terminology is that it seeks to vilify men wholesale. That's my problem with it. And if yeah. that's what the intent is, then I got a problem. Because you can't, if you're going to vilify men wholesale, then you're going to have to include the Prophet in that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. where we sort of have to draw the line as Muslims. Yeah, you got to draw the line. Who, who are you going to yeah. put under the lens? I, yeah. I vilify oppression. Yeah. I vilify okay. transgressions. I vilify all of that stuff. And I don't care from whom it comes from. But I'm not going to take half of the population of the human species and claim that because they have XY chromosomes and penises that they are terrible people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, end of the day, it's like... So if, you, if women just vilify men... Then you have to include Prophet Muhammad in that fold, saying that he didn't understand women either. 
is that well that's the that's the thing that's the point i made in the magnum loops like you just push this all the way to the end and you'll get to that conclusion yeah that if it's patriarchy is bad and women are oppressed all the time and there's nothing going right for them it's like yeah. all right so even the process i didn't understand your plight but i like that point you made about how post-structuralist thought in general it sort of helps us break down the various sort of factors that influence society yeah. like orientalism for example it's sort of like a couple of decades ago it sort of revolutionized how we thought about the world as in yeah. the west as the civilized mm-hmm. rational modern progressive mm-hmm. and how they drew up the eastern opposition to that yeah so where the barbaric backwards tribalistic irrational pretty Probably. much what it is that's yeah. as in this opposition that the west creates to sort of uphold its own self-image yeah. And to say that Muslims are other than that. And yep. that comes from the Foucauldian power knowledge. Yes. Our knowledge is determined by the power the West had. Yeah. They created that knowledge to yes. say Muslims are just this, they're irrational. Yeah. And they're backwards. So that's where I feel it's so much benefit to us. As in, yeah. if Edward Said hadn't done that, our analyses of society would be stuck in a different place. Do you get me? Yeah. And because Muslims, it's become common knowledge for us. As in, yeah. The West so portrays us like this. I would also highlight that this is for Muslims in the West for us to understand that. But if you go in the East, yeah, they the knew East. that very well. <laughs> it's like our tradition is so rich, man. And like we have yeah, very intelligent people and they knew exactly what was going on. And they were talking about that before Edward Said was talking about it. So, and there are Arabic figures like Malik bin Nabi is a very famous Algerian scholar, a social scientist. Yeah. And he talked very much about along the same lines. And his message was... So if you talk to Arab Muslims right now, just how we talk about Edward Said in the West, they talk about Malik bin Nabi. Really? And he came yeah. up with like an analytic of, way of describing a lot of this, what the West is doing. A lot of the stuff is, yeah, he just he was pointing out all of these issues that were being brought up. And, oh, okay. So I yeah. guess that's in the scholarship we don't really have access to. Yeah, so that's English the unfortunate yet. bit. It's like, you know... You have to sort of delve into the You have to delve yeah. into the stuff. And, and if you talk to Arab scholars, especially those that are coming from Morocco, Egypt... You find some very insightful figures coming from that area. Yeah. And yeah. they, and even from Saudi Arabia, by the way. You know, people that like to vilify Saudi Arabia and say, like, oh, we'll have you this, we'll have you that, and it's like backwards and closed off and stuff. On YouTube, they have like conferences. It's, these are the videos that get like 20 views. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad because I listen to these you guys to talking, it, yeah. and it's really in the middle stuff. of Qasim, like the most conservative place you can find in Saudi Arabia. Talking about some high level stuff with regards to philosophy wow, and postmodernism so and stuff. We don't and even, even know. I didn't know that. With like I mean, culture. very <laughs> strong grasp yeah. of the stuff. So these yeah. guys are not small timers. They're very intelligent people. The thing with Saudi Arabia is that they just have an, uh, they're kind of like Immanuel Kant about it. In the sense that Immanuel Kant, his position was keep public order and have these discussions as heretical as you want to get yeah, but keep them. in closed circles. Oh, okay. Saudi that Arabia, that's how it operates. So these guys, discussions do happen, but we just don't see they them. They happen. You yeah. just don't see them. Okay. Or YouTube just doesn't give you the algorithm. So <laughs> but like it happens. And these guys are... I've engaged. I've talked to a lot of Saudis, man, that yeah. study in, in Saudi Arabia, in the universities. Very insightful. Very intelligent. They break down a lot of wow, things. okay. And Who to a, a very high level degree. Yeah. But unfortunately, the media gives you this perception... Yeah. Oh, look, this sheikh from Saudi yeah. Arabia said that the sun doesn't rotate yeah. or whatever. <laughs> that's so insane. Yeah, like, that's, that, that's just, that, that's typified. On a yeah. deep yeah. level, that just, me knowing about that now, it shows that I've been, you know, low Condition. key weight, yeah. conditioned yeah. subconsciously yeah. by this the society that I'm living yeah. in. Yeah. So I'm falling into kind of a divide already without yeah. knowing yeah. there not being a divide. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how the mind works. Yeah, like, yeah. Just to make the final point then about all these new Western trends and thoughts. So you'd say they're of benefit, but it's not like Muslims didn't have those discussions themselves. Muslims are having the discussions uh, yeah, okay. themselves. These things are of benefit. Are of benefit. Okay. And the proof that they are of benefit is because the Prophet ﷺ indicated in the hadith that you will find things of benefit elsewhere. So don't... Even don't, if it's brought up in the United States or like... Anywhere. Europe, anywhere. Okay. Anywhere. Anywhere. The Prophet ﷺ said, anywhere you find wisdom, you have more right to yeah. it. Even if they're... Not that it's yeah. okay for you to take it. Yeah. No, it's that you must take it. You oh. have a right to it. But we have to take it in our own way then, because there's sort of yeah, epistemology no. and stuff. Exactly. It's, so it's, that's where you have to um, understand epistemology. It's atheistic. Yeah. So the, I guess the hard work then is sort of to rehash it in a way that accorded with our beliefs. Yes. Sort of thing. Yes. That's hard work then. As in that's it's the, very hard that's work. That's the job of the scholars, yeah. you'd say. Yeah. yeah. Just to make a final point on what I was saying. These, these sort of isms, they create, 
big schisms in our society. <laughs> <laughs> ah, as in, like you have drop the mic. <laughs> you <laughs> have you have you have one half of the community saying we have we want nothing to do with feminism, and everybody who believes in this stuff is taken up by Western ideas, yeah. and they're like modernists or whatever. And the other half are like, no, those are the. I don't know quacks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they they're sort of like too radical, and yeah. they're not permitting Islam to move forward by questioning its cultural baggage. As in, how do you propose we negotiate that? We have in the Islamic tradition in the usul al-urf, al-urf, al-urf muhakkam, yeah. which is cultural norms yes. are part of legislation. This is something that the scholars have acknowledged for fourteen hundred years. I don't understand why it's a problem. So. The question becomes, the Prophet said, I was only sent to complete or perfect noble characters yes. of human beings. So Islam comes into a culture, whatever is beneficial, improve upon it. Whatever yep. is harmful, remove that, you know, stop doing that. Yep. And so, and that's how you move forward. I guess we have so, to take these thoughts on board then because they're part of our customs is that what you're saying as in sort of we have to understand them and you have to them understand with. them you can't just blanket reject yeah, blanket, everybody okay, yeah, yeah. you have to before you reject anything understand understand it. it okay that's why i'm just you know whenever i talk with an atheist for example the, some of the questions asked have you read the quran yeah you know <laughs> have you read the yeah. seer of the prophet have you read the biography of the prophet yeah. have you investigated yeah. this properly <laughs> And 99.9% of the time, the answer is no. And it's like, okay, that's not a fair discussion to have then. Yep. Because I read the books you're going to talk about, but you didn't read the book that I yeah, talk yeah. about. And Small then you're just going to automatically reject it. Either don't engage in the discussion or just yeah. go read something. So seeking knowledge is basically part of our nature as a Muslim to yeah. endeavor. And I feel, as you said, through the media and through society, it's just kind of culture in a way that yeah. people are perceiving that okay Muslim people just study that irrelevant irrational yeah. Muslim things yeah. and then it's creating divide in itself really. yeah so Dr. Galan as we've explored a few kind of standards of modernism and I, I want to bring the focus back to on the reality of the youth even though there are benefits from the points we've discussed you know, touching on you know modernism as a means of looking at reality I want to yeah. bring a focus where if the real problem stems where people internalize that especially the youth they internalize these kinds of pressures so for example they kind of take this on board as a means of reforming or contextualizing or changing the theme yeah so for example when there are uh, reconciled legal conflict there are you know they're saying things like oh it's in the spirit of the law in <laughs> terms of what we're trying to achieve in, with the law <laughs> yeah, yeah so i just want to ask as a means of kind of tying everything together how do we reconcile modern science and philosophy with Islam as a means of you know, having a standard of truth? The only way to reconcile any of this stuff is for young Muslims to first study some basic aqidah and basic yeah. theology before going into any of this stuff. Yeah. Because I've taught aqidah before several times and what I've experienced in the feedback from the students is when they get taught a cognitive frame, because teaching aqidah in Islam is not just about teaching didactic, here is a list of things to believe. Yeah. It's about framing your cognitive approach to things. And when you have the right cognitive framing, then you will start to see, first of all, you'll be able to identify when the scientist is philosophizing and when he's just or she's just yeah. reporting to you some facts. Yeah. And when they're philosophizing, you'll start, and if you studied your own aqidah, then you'll start to have a a better didactic dialogue internally and then following that externally with I'm okay with this but I'm not okay with that that's the first step to before you talk about reconciliation if anything you first have to have some basic understanding of your religion mm. and fortunately for a lot of Muslims they, they don't do that and so they end up going to college and they have or university and they have this you know almost like a cognitive dissonance you know you mm. enter and then you get taught these things and then you're like but my sheikh says that or you know i heard the imam say that at the Jum'ah khutbah and, yeah. and so that's where they have yeah, the i issue. feel like it's just a really basic training that's needed when i started studying philosophy and history like my first year i, I went to a akida class alongside that and it was just really basic stuff about how like the omnipotence of god and the different basic points where we were working through and that sort of solidified my faith enough such that I wouldn't take philosophy yeah. any deeper than it needs to be. Yes, read. yes. Like, I feel like it's not even that hard to get that grounding. Yeah. Or that it's not that hard. That's the thing. Religion. Our religion is not that complicated, guys. Like, it's just, I, I can't stress that enough. Like, we try to complicate things too much. Our religion is a simple religion, but it is not a simpleton religion. Yeah. It's simple in the sense that the basic premises, the cognitive framing that you have, anybody can, can grasp it. Yeah. But it's not simpleton that you can just dismiss it. 
Yeah. You want to go high level? We'll take it high level. You want to go high? We'll go so high that you lose oxygen. <laughs> and we'll still be breathing because we'll be all right. So you just got to get the cognitive framing in place and just... And then you'll find your life becomes a lot easier, you know? Yeah. And if you have that, Definitely. and especially if you have it on a day-to-day basis and you practice it all the time, you'll start to identify these things. It becomes second nature to you, yeah. almost, you know, when you see them and when it, wherever you're exposed to them. And then after that, the reconciliation will present itself on its own without having to force it on anybody. Definitely. Awesome. So, Jazaka Khamera for coming in and all the very best in your studies and your future projects. Yeah. We would love to have future collaborations as there's heaps of discussion points, uh, especially with Tanzania. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll travel to Queensland. Yeah, we'll have a road trip now. Inshallah. 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 10 hour drive. <laughs> Boring 10 hour drive right here. Yes. <laughs> for our listeners out there, thank you so much for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at boysinthecave at gmail.com or you can find us on Facebook and you can follow us on Instagram. Please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes as that greatly helps us. From our special guest, Dr. Gillan, and my boys, Kanzim and Josh, we want to wish you all the best. This is Akib, signing off. Assalamu alaikum. وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَنْ نَدْعُوَ مِنْ دُونِهِ إِلَهَا لقد قلنا إذا شططا هؤلاء قوم اتخذوا من دونه آلهة لولا يأتون عليهم بسلطان بين فمن أظلم ممن افترى على الله كذباً